and uh, the the conclusion of the author was that Israel did not deserve the ark nor did Philistia nor did Judah in whose hands did the ark end up? Hmm? The Canaanites. In the end, it is the Gibeonites. The old Gibeonite league that had misled Israel into a covenant with them and that Israel had accepted as temple slaves they end up with the ark in their hands in their territory it doesn't go back to Israel it doesn't go to Judah and it doesn't stay in Philistia the great irony and this is the deliberate point of the author of the ark narrative is that the ark belongs to and with the Canaanites okay they are the only people who are worthy of its presence Now what was it again? The ark was a what was its special function, Roy? Yeah. Yeah. It was in battle. Yahweh's a man of war, it says in the Song of the Sea. It was the ark that went around the city of Jericho to cause its destruction. The ark led Israel into battle against the Canaanites. Where is it now? It's with the Canaanites. Has this has the author of the Ark narrative noticed this irony? Um, yeah. So does he say then that Israel has repented? No. Whatever caused the Ark to be lost, what does he say? Yes. When the Ark narrative is written. Whatever it was that caused the ark to be lost is still there. Now, what is his reason that he has given for the ark to be lost? Remember? It's there. Hmm? Um. <clears throat> Where's the first verse of the ark narrative? Where's once upon a time? We know it, it ends that, and they all lived unhappily ever after. First Samuel 2, verse 12. That's a very ominous statement. Right. Is Israel brought to ruin? by two men ah the corporate personality business again what do you say well but the the art narrative opens not with Eli but with the two sons they're identified as the chief problem and Eli's dragged in as a secondary problem in that he never stayed the tide yes he's fully involved in their guilt but my question is even if you want to add Eli in was Israel destroyed and brought to, to ruin by two men or two men and their old father How do you know that? Well, um, they were the leaders. Because later on, the they were the leaders, yes. So, um, this is probably from the pick on anymore, right? Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> because later on, when Samuel talking to Israel, he says, "If you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, uh, 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 u
wait a minute, we're talking about the Ark narrative. You might as well read something to me from the book of Revelation to explain it. All right, all right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right Exegesis does not proceed in dragging in unrelated material, does it? Well, the priest, priesthood was supposed to be pure. That's true, purer than the rest. And if the priesthood is corrupt, not necessarily, or at least as corrupt. Your leaders lead you, right? Not well. That is the basic principle of corporate identity. But you have to remember that when God came to Elijah, He said there were seven thousand that had not bent their knees to all the priests that had not bent their knees. Well, but now, if you read the Ark narrative, and had you been with us, you would know that one of the Ark narrative author's great concerns is the suffering of the innocent with the guilty. The people of Akron don't want to get involved at all. They're upset because the people of Ashdod, a greater city in the Pentapolis, has dragged the Ark to Ashdod, finds out they can't deal with it, and drags it off to, to Gath and Ekron, and they don't want it. And one of his great concerns is, what happens when the innocent suffer with the guilty? That's part of what he's discussing. It is assumed, of course, that there are 7,000 who haven't bent the knee to Baal. All along, that's the idea of the remnant. But that is not the issue. The issue is, was Israel brought to ruin by two men and a doting father? Sure. No. Well, the answer is no, Don, it's just to help you, but... How do you know? What has the author told us that indicates the problem? What? The fact that none of the Israelite towns wanted it when it got back tells you that they themselves were as corrupt as the Philistines. They knew. What was their great question? Who can stand before this holy thing? All right. That's certainly an indicator. That's a strong indicator. I don't know if, like, 421, where the child was born and he was named and the glory has departed from Israel. Yes. That gives you some indication. It's not that the glory has departed from Hophni and Phineas, and it's not that the glory has departed from Eli, and it's not that the glory has departed from Shiloh, but the glory has departed from Israel. That gives you some indication, yes? Let's take a stand in the third verse of that, for us, so the people of heaven and the elders of Israel say, that's an indication to me that it's more of these three people. And what did they say? They said, wherefore hath the Lord spitten us today before those who What has not yet... What has not yet happened? What has not yet happened in verse 2? They haven't got the ark yet. The author of the narrative has made it painfully clear at the outset that it is Israel as a whole that is under Yahweh's judgment. They do, in fact, reflect the priesthood. They call for the very priesthood that is corrupt to save them. They have already been routed by Yahweh and they know it. They don't say, why have the gods of the Philistines routed us today? What do they say? Why has Yahweh routed us today? And that is the question that is the basis of the whole narrative. Because every way along, Yahweh is routing somebody and the question is, why? This is the key verse in the narrative. 4, verse 3. And when the battle line was spread out, Israel was defeated by the Philistines who slew four contingents of men on the battlefield. And when the troops returned to the camp, the elders of Israel, and the elders of Israel is an assembly. It is the assembly that runs the country. Have I made that clear yet? The elders of Israel isn't two or three folk. Who are the elders of Israel? Hmm? The 70. Who are they? They're the officials of each tribe who meet in an assembly and run the country. 
They represent the country as the whole. They are the National Assembly. They say, why has Yahweh put us, Israel, to the rout today before the Philistines? The last time the elders of Israel said that, they didn't stop to get an answer. What happens this time? What happens here? Once again, as we saw in Judges, what? They don't wait for an answer. What do they do? Yes. Yes. Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh, actually the Ark of Yahweh, here from Shiloh, that he may come among us and save us. There is an obvious contradiction here. What is it? Yes. If they were on the right track when they asked this question and had they not left it and, uh, as a uh, rhetorical question, had they asked it as a serious question, why has Yahweh routed us today, then what would, the, what would have to happen next? Find out. Find out what the answer is and straighten out whatever that problem is. Don't, without making atonement, don't, without making atonement, do what? The last person I want to see, if I'm in trouble with God, is what? Who do I not want to see? I do not want to see God until what? Until I have straightened out whatever it is that I am in trouble with him for. You see the contradiction? If Yahweh has put them to the route, what do they not need? What should they desperately not want to see? Uh -huh. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it may be the King James translation, but there also seems to be a problem for me. Uh, they're asking about the Lord, and then they want to go out to the ark so they get it from the center, rather than the Lord. Is that an indication? <clears throat> well, it's a semi-pagan idea. It is the object by which Yahweh is to be approached. It, uh, Obviously, every symbol of God can become what? An idol, in some way or another. Now look, atonement needs to be made. The question, why has Yahweh put us to the route, indicates that atonement needs to be made. And the poor Philistines are in desperate trouble and things are getting worse and worse for them. Until what? Until the priests of Philistia suggest what? What should we do? Well, but no. The, if their suggestion was send the ark back, it wouldn't have gone anywhere. What did they suggest? A guilt offering. A guilt offering. They had committed a crime against Yahweh for which they wished to make a covering. Because after all, the word compare does not mean atone, does it? We always speak about the Day of Atonement. We spoke about the Day of Atonement, Leviticus 16 this morning. Technically, that's not correct, is it? Atonement is a Western idea. Right? To atone for something is a thoroughly Western theological concept that isn't in the Bible. What does the verb compare mean? To do what? To cover. To cover what specifically? We talked about this in Leviticus. What is covered? Sin. Not the person. Now, what, how is sin viewed in Leviticus? Let's re remind ourselves about that. How is sin viewed? What is sin in Leviticus? Unholiness, Unholiness yes. What is sin? Uh, there's a mistranslation from Isaiah. Exegesis, let me say this while I'm looking at you. Exegesis does not mean to drag into a passage something from another part of the Bible that doesn't apply. You will get all sorts of horrible doctrines if you do that. My question was, what is sin in Leviticus? Therefore, if you don't know the definition of Leviticus, you can't answer. What is sin in Leviticus? <clears throat> what is sin in Leviticus? It is not called curse in Leviticus. Don't get. What is sin in Leviticus? What is the primary model for sin in Leviticus? 
There's no text that says transgression of the law. You may not drag in a text from the New Testament that has nothing to do with Leviticus. Thereby you will misread this passage. What is sin in Leviticus? We spent months on Leviticus. What is sin in Leviticus? What is the primary model of sin in Leviticus? Contamination. Contamination. That's the first time anybody said anything about contamination, so don't say right. It's now. Where is the day of covering found in Leviticus? 16. What is 16 in Leviticus? What? The, the, the manual of what? Purification, purification from what? Uh, okay, Uncleanness. I'm going to ask it again. Maybe we can get a little closer. What is sin in Leviticus? Un that's close. Uncleanness causes it. What is sin in Leviticus? What? Oh, it is a disease. Thank you. I thought we'd never get there right. Sin is a disease. And what is the effect of this disease? Yeah. Not sickness. Yeah. Death. It's what kind of a disease then? Yeah. A fatal disease. It is viewed entirely as a disease. How can you see the manifestation of sin? How can you see the manifestation of sin? Leprosy. Well, leprosy or leprous is the general word for what? No, not got cleanness for what? We're talking all around it now. Be precise here. Leprous in Leviticus is a word for what word in English that we would use? We wouldn't say he's stay away, he's leprous. We never use that word. Contagious. Sin is contagious. You can catch it from someone else. Sin is a contagious disease. Again, let's start again. How can you see the manifestation of sin in Leviticus? What happens? How do you know there's sin around here somewhere? Somebody gets sick. And if one person gets sick and there's sin around here somewhere, what else? Other people are going to catch it and get sick. And what's going to happen? What's going to happen to those folk who are sick? They're going to die. And how many of them are going to die? Everyone's going to die. Because sin is a fatal leprous disease. It's a fatal contagious disease. I'm going to ask again. The Day of Atonement would more properly be translated what? Day of literally what day of covering covering kepair did you get it did everybody get it kepair is the Hebrew verb to cover not cleanse to cover what is it that's covered sin why is a something thrown over it so that it won't what spread it is the sin that is covered something is thrown over it so that it can't spread any further. What is the manifestation that there's sin around here somewhere? People get sick and they die. Now what happened to the Philistines? No, no, no. What happened to the Egyptians? They got sick and some died. And what happened? From one plague, they moved on to another that got worse, and more folk got sick, and more folk died. And you can tell by the progression that what's happening. More and more people are getting sick, more and more people are catching the disease, and what? More and more people are dying. Given enough time, basing on this process, what will happen? Everybody in Egypt will be dead. In Philistia, what happens? That starts happening in the That starts happening, and the Philistines 
as they see it happening, say, "Uh uh-oh, something bad is going on here. There's sin around here somewhere, and they figure it out. We've caught this from, catch this now, we've caught this from the Israelites. So what did they finally conclude? They moved it from city to city and what followed along with the ark? Plane. What has there got to be? What has there got to be? Hmm? If sin is here, what do we need? We need covering. We've got to cover the sin somehow. And so what did they do? What kind of suggestion that they make to stop the plaguing of the sin that they were stuck with. What did they suggest? First of all, tell us with what we shall send it to its place. They said, if you send away the ark of the God of Israel, don't send away empty, but by all means, return to him a guilt offering then you will be then you will be healed he's using the Levitical terminology for sin and atonement the Philistines were sick with sin they needed to be healed they offered a guilt offering for covering Mm. not the right guilt offering but God accepts their guilt offering as sufficient for covering right and then it comes to Beth Shemesh and we find that the people of Judah are even less even less capable than the Philistines of dealing with the problem Right? So they say, who is able to stand before Yahweh, this holy God? And what does stand before mean in 620? <clears throat> what is the terminology? What does the Hebrew phrase to stand before mean? Be righteous. What is the phrase to stand before? What does it mean if you say, I stand before the king? What does it mean if you say, I stand before Yahweh? What does it mean if you say, I stand before the clan chief? What does it mean? No. That was being being a servant, of course. It means to be in the service of, to be in the ministry of. They're saying, who can be in the service of Yahweh? Evidently not Judah. (laughs) Evidently not Israel. This is a technical term for being in the service of some important person. An official of the king is the one who stands before the king. It's a typical phrase that occurs again and again. When Samuel stood before the Ark of Yahweh, it means he'd become a priest. They're asking, who can be in the service of Yahweh, this holy God? The rhetorical question indicates that evidently they cannot. We've already found out that the Philistines cannot. We found out that the Israelites cannot. Now we're finding out that the Judeans cannot be in the service of Yahweh. So, who does it turn out can be in the service of Yahweh? They sent to the inhabitants of Kiriath Jerem saying, the Philistines have returned the Ark of Yahweh, come down and take it up to you. Now, in a sense, the folks of Kiriath Jerem were stuck because they were slaves. They came, got it. Why? Well, they had to. I suppose that the men of Beth Shemesh thought what? Huh? Yeah, I suppose that they thought the Gibeonites would be killed by having the ark. But what happened? They consecrated his son Eliezer to have charge of the Ark of Yahweh. 
<coughs> so it ends obviously where it began with a change in priesthood that was the beginning point the need for a change in priesthood yes this is naturally the conclusion if the beginning what was the beginning verse yes so we have the rejected priesthood and what do we have at the end the acceptable priesthood so it goes full circle as you would expect it to okay. so part of the art narrative is what what how properly do you make covering for sin what is acceptable as a way to make covering for sin how should it be done how can it be done what is acceptable service to Yahweh that's part of the whole concern of the ark narrative as well as to say why did it leave us hmm. so let's answer the question just to make sure we picked it up what was the answer to the question why has Yahweh put us to the uh, route today before the Philistines What had Israel done? Anything? Where do you read that? Is uh, seven three part of the art narrative? Where does the art narrative end? What's the last verse? What did I just tell you? Seven thirteen. Seven fourteen. Well, is it 7 1 is the last verse, or is it 7 2? Well, the next narrative would then begin, then Samuel said to all the house of Israel, does that sound like a good beginning? No. no. Clearly not. Try it again, Richard. So 7-2 is the start of the next. 7-2 so is the beginning of a new story. It says clearly once upon a time. Yeah. Yes. So what's the end of the arc narrative? Seven, yes. When they consecrate the new priesthood, then it's over. What had Israel done wrong then, Roy? They had done something wrong. Do you, what, what does the arc narrative say they'd done wrong? The priesthood was corrupt, yes, but what had Israel done wrong? What specific, that's all very general, what specifically had Israel done wrong? Look, it begins this way. The sons of Eli were hellions. They were worthless men who had contempt for Yahweh. It ends this way. And so they consecrated this individual named Eliezer to have proper charge of the Ark of Yahweh. There's the beginning, there's the end. What had Israel specifically this time done wrong? It makes it very clear. What had it done wrong? What should Israel have done? They should have gotten rid of the priesthood of Eli. Specifically, they should have changed the priesthood. When that change was accomplished, the story was what? Okay. Over. Again, what specifically? Not they were bad. 
Not they just weren't good people. What specifically was the problem? They, yeah, so what does that tell you? If they were... They were in charge. They, uh, they didn't take charge. What should the elders of Israel have done? Yes, they should have removed them. Oh, well. What, you think the people are responsible for their leaders? That's what it does sound like here, doesn't it? It sounds like the author of the Ark narrative thinks the people are responsible for their leaders, as well as the leaders being responsible for the people. Oh, my. Well, are we saying that the people are responsible or that the elders of Israel were responsible for the priesthood that they allowed? The elders of Israel were responsible for that priesthood. But let's very quickly hasten on to say, who were the elders of Israel? Represent, yes, Israel was egalitarian. That's right. The elders of Israel weren't just anybody. They could have been changed too if they were not fulfilling their duty. Well, we've already seen that the priesthood was not above manipulating to change kings and things like that. If they didn't. Well, we haven't already seen anything about kings yet. <laughs> well, leaders. All right. But, but, but we did when they wanted a king, they... We, we didn't see anything about a king yet. We're reading the art narrative. <laughs> the people are held responsible for their leaders, for tolerating leaders that they knew to be sinful. The people were held responsible for tolerating leaders that they knew to be sinful and making no move to eject them. That's what the author of the Ark narrative is saying. Are you telling me something that the Bible doesn't say? They were powerless? Where did you get that idea? Now you're reading into the Bible something it doesn't say. That's called asegesis. What made you think they were powerless? When God is holding them responsible, you can be sure they weren't powerless. It's because I, 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 I think you don't understand what, how the assembly of Israel operated. They weren't powerless. They made and unmade people at will. We're going to look at the negotiations with Jephthah as a perfect example. The assembly negotiated for a new leadership when they needed it. No, they weren't powerless. God is holding them responsible for a corrupt leadership that they refused to change because they found that leadership acceptable. They should have asked this question and they should have answered it. Why is Yahweh put us to the route today? This is immediately after the statement that the sons of Eli were worthless men who had no regard for Yahweh. It moves directly from the awful priesthood to the fact that God routes Israel and the assembly says why and doesn't ask for the answer. It's already given the answer. We're reading the art narrative. The art narrative doesn't drag in any 300 guys running around anywhere. The art narrative is about the destruction. Pardon? Ah, where could such a narrative have arisen that was so violently anti Shiloh, that was so violently anti Eli, that was so very much pro Eliezer and the Eliezer priesthood? Uh, well, first of all, you're off by centuries, so I'm not even going to repeat what you're saying, lest you utterly confuse other people. Just at this point, meditate, and we'll go on. Ah, well, of course, the art narrative, you know the answer to this, Ed. The art narrative 
is incorporated as the Deuteronomic history. Did the Deuteronomist write this? Again, Ed, again. When would this have been written? No, 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 no. Ed, Ed. What question does it have to answer? Why was the what? Why was the ark taken captive to Philistia? Why did it end up in the hands of the Canaanite priesthood? That question could only have been asked, Ed, when? When the ark was where? No, it's not in Philistia at the end, Ed. In the Canaanite. The Gibeonites have it. I'm going to say it again. When would this narrative had to have been written? When the ark was with the Gibeonites. Was, it, was this a burning theological question? Why did the Gibeonites have it? When it was housed in the state shrine in Jerusalem, at the center of the greatest empire of its day? No. So let me ask you again. When was the Deuteronomic history written? During the time of um, Josiah. And when was that? Date? Um, Somebody help him. When did Jer Josiah come to the throne? What year of his what of his regular years did the uh, great Josianic reform begin? Well, this is why we're struggling, because we've got basic stuff still hazy. Josiah's reign, 639 to 609, the, the, the Josianic reform, beginning in his 18th year, which if you subtract will be 621 B.C. Ed, what year was this arc narrative occurring? Do you have even the foggiest idea? Can you give me a century? Can you tell me who it was before or after? 11th century. 11th century. When, what year was Shiloh destroyed approximately? 1050. How many years before Josiah's time did this all happen? 500 years. Huh? Well, six. 1050, 630, 400 years. More than 400 years earlier. Ed, this story was all over 430 years before Josiah's reform. Was this written at the time of Josiah by the Deuteronomist? No. During what I said we would say to the very time, during what decade did the art narrative have to be written? During what period? No, the, uh, that's when it left Shiloh. Well, where, during what period was this written? How long was the ark in the hands of the Gibeonites? 20 years. So from about 1050 to 1030, that's the period when this question would be a burning question. How many years before the time of Josiah, Ed? More than 400 years. Now, answer your own question for the class, because this will help. Who did not write this story? The Deuteronomist did not write this story. There's no hint that Moses wrote it. Don't, please don't try, you're, there are new people here that you might confuse. Please don't do that. All right, now look. It was written at the time that there was a burning question about why this had happened. Why Israel and Judah had lost the ark? Why has it gone to Philistia and come back to the Canaanites? That was during this 20-year period. Ed? Yes. What priesthood is attacked here? What priesthood is violently attacked here? The Mushite priesthood. Does the name Eliezer ring any bells at all? Yes. It was a name found in not the son of Aaron, because these are names. This was a name found what? 
in the Aaronite priesthood. The question was, I believe that you raised dead, was where did this come from? What's an answer? From what circles would this have come? From the Aaronite priesthood. Yes. Yeah. That's right. In the late pre monarchic period. Is everybody clear on how we arrived at that? Got it? You, you all understand that there were two great priestly families, one for Moses, one for Aaron. Which priestly family is being rejected and attacked verbally and violently in this narrative? The Mushite, the Mosaic priesthood, and who does it end up with? Who is the attendant that the Gibeonites call to help? An Aaronite. And of course, when we come to the monarchy and we see the ark again, it's going to be with two priests. One from Aaron and one from Moses. Well, where was the Aaronite priesthood set up or whatever at the time? Who were they working for? Well, well, I'll give you some. Uh, of course, who were they working for is sort of a silly question. What did priests do? They were working for the people. Well, some of them the king more later. Well, again, we're not reading the Bible backwards. To answer his question more precisely, what did priests do? They helped with the covering of sins, yes. They taught the law. They maintained holy places. Uh, again, we've been down this road many times, but again, can anybody without guessing name some Aaronite priestly cities? I've never heard of Jerusalem. Again, can anybody uh, name some Aaronite priestly cities? Largely. Hebron. Yes, of course. That's the first one that leaps out at you. Hebron, an Aaronite city. What are some others? Yes, Beth Shemesh, Joshua says, is an Aaronite priestly center. But there weren't any Aaronites there yet, and that's what the Ark narrative author says was the problem that caused the Beth Shemites to get killed. What do they need? They need a good Aaronite priest. That's what they need. And what does Joshua 15 say they got? They got a good Aaronite priesthood eventually. See? And now, if you remembered that little detail from Joshua, you would have recognized immediately the polemic that's being made about Beth Shemesh not having any priests. Did you catch what she just said or what I just said to her? Joshua 15 says Beth Shemesh was an Aaronite center, eventually. Joshua had already identified it as a place where Aaronites were to go. But the author of the art narrative says there weren't any priests there. And so the Beth Shemites got killed. Okay. All right, what are some other places? We've identified Beth Shemesh and, and Hebron. Any others that you can remember? How about one in the north? Very dramatically one in the north. An Aaronite, An Aaronite one in the north, yes. No. An Aaronite temple city in the north. Has anybody ever heard of Bethel? Uh, as a child and he would have and the genealogies later link him now we know that his father was the da 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 but of course genealogies aren't biological are they later in chronicles we're going to find his genealogy goes back to the Moshite priesthood because he was part of that family he was identified with the Shilonite priesthood of Moses. What was Samuel doing? Very interesting question. The Ark narrative is silent about Samuel and his existence, isn't it? Yeah, because he's a Moshite. 
<laughs> Here you go. I, just before I could even get to it. <laughs> Can't even say why before you get to it. To the Aaronite, who was Samuel? No, he wasn't nobody. He was what? Well, he was the leader of... <laughs> he, he was a Mushite priest as far as they were concerned. Mm. The most powerful of the Mushite priests of his day, yes. Not something that they would have looked on with favor. All right, that accounts for what the great difference is when we read the next chapter. We're going to find it very different. All right. Is there any way you could uh, like put on the board the Aaronite priest places and the Mushite priest places so we can straighten our heads where they were? Yeah, I could do that, but there's only a couple of them you recognize anyway, so let's just leave it simple. Hebron and Bethel. <laughs> okay. Hebron and Bethel. Mm -hmm. What were the Mushite ones? Well, can you name some for us? Shiloh. Shiloh, yeah. Shechem. Shechem was one. Yes. Well, Bethel and Shiloh were pretty close together there. Yeah, they're less than 20 miles apart, yes. They're, the they're very close together, yes. All right, enough of that. Um, in summary, Ed, from what circles would the art narrative have come? Oh, you used the wrong term because both the Mushites and Aaronites are what? They're both Levites, so sharpen it up a little more. The, from the Aaronite priesthood. Why is the Deuteronomy using it at this point? Why would he use a narrative that was so much against his own priesthood? No, uh, the, the Deuteronomist fully believes that the Moshite priesthood has been rejected. Even though he is of that dependency or that tendency? Well, let me tell you a story. The story is found in Jeremiah. Turn over to Jeremiah. It's the great temple sermon in Jeremiah chapter 7. See why this is significant. The word that came to Jeremiah from Yahweh. Stand in the gate of Yahweh's house and proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of Yahweh, all you men of Judah who enter these gates and worship Yahweh. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your doings, and I will let you dwell in this place. Do not trust in these deceptive words, This is the temple of Yahweh, the temple of Yahweh, the temple of Yahweh. For if you... What was the implication of this is the temple of Yahweh? What were they saying by that? What, why? What will be the case with the temple? Well, we have explicit promises. What would be the case with the temple? It was dead forever. Right? All right. But if you are truly amend your ways and your doings, if you truly execute justice one with another, if you do not oppress the alien, the fatherless, or the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not go after other gods to your own hurt, then, here's the then, if then, then I will let you dwell in this place in a land that I gave of old to your fathers forever. Again, what's the nature of prophecy? Conditional. Yes. Then I will let you dwell in this place in the land that I gave of old to your fathers forever. The next version says, then I shall dwell with you in this place then I will dwell with you instead of you dwell here. A mm -hmm. uh, textual problem. We'll look at it in detail when we get there. Either way, it doesn't um, uh, alter the point we're making. Behold, you trust in deceptive words to no avail. Who's the speaker on? Who's speaking here in Jeremiah 7? Yeah, who's the spokesman? Who's the messenger of the Lord? Jeremiah. Who is Jeremiah? He's a Mushite priest, okay? Behold, you trust in deceptive words to no avail. 
Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, clearly Deuteronomic in its viewpoint, and say we are delivered, only to go on doing all these abominations? Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, I myself have seen it, says Yahweh. Go now to my place that was in Shiloh, where I made my name dwell at first, and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. Why is that especially telling when Jeremiah says it? Because Shiloh was what? It's, the, it's his ancestry. That's where the Mushite priesthood was centered. And yet, how does he view it here? As a Deuteronomist, and as a member of that family, how does he nevertheless view it? As an example of rejection. As an example of rejection, yes. So, there's no more surprise in the use of the Ark narrative than there is surprise in this temple sermon. Now I know I'm tiptoeing all around saying that Jeremiah was the Deuteronomist, but you get my point. Um, and now, because you have done all these things, says Yahweh, and when I spoke to you persistently, you did not listen, and when I called to you, you did not answer, therefore I will do to the house which is called by my name, and in which you trust, and to the place which I gave to you and to your fathers, as I did to Shiloh. So here's the Deuteronomic prophet in the time of Josiah, using Shiloh and the priesthood there, as an example of rejection. And by the way, what was the cause of the destruction of Shiloh? Verse 12, Go now to my place that was in Shiloh, where I made my name dwell at first, and see what I did to it for the wickedness of Eli and his sons. Is that what it says? <laughs> in, the, in line with the view of the Ark narrative, what? For the wickedness of whom? Of my people Israel. The people as a whole are under condemnation. All right. Yes. Well, it's coming, isn't it? Now, this wouldn't be considered reading back into it, even now. Well, what his question was, why would the Deuteronomist, centuries later, use the Ark narrative, which is anti-Shiloh, anti-Mushite priesthood? And I turn to the Deuteronomist in the time of Josiah, and I find that one of his major positions is that Shiloh and the Shilonite priesthood are samples of God's rejection. And would we consider this valid evidence of our point that it wasn't just the, uh, the priests, but it was the people? Sure, absolutely, because um, it comes from the time, if not the very person, who is the Deuteronomist. Now then, Yes. So the Ark narrative, uh, was it written by one person or a group of people? Well, yeah, uh, this is always a good question. Did one person write it? Probably. But did he represent a viewpoint or a school of thought? Yes. So, uh, remember that they didn't see individuals as writing for, from an individual viewpoint, right? They saw the person as writing from a tribal or... Um, clan viewpoint. You understand what I'm saying? So that if one person puts forth an idea, who's responsible for that idea? Not just that person, but what? The group. Because in Western culture, our emphasis is on the individual, but in ancient Eastern culture, as in other cultures, the emphasis is on what? It's on the group. There's solidarity of the whole group of Israel. And the, the author of the Ark narrative says sometimes, because of that, innocent individuals, what? Suffer because of the wickedness of the group as a whole. Yeah. That issue is going to be taken up at greater length later in the Old Testament that the remnant often suffers for the majority, right along with the majority. Right? Okay. Any, anything else? 
Yes. Yes. Because, of course, these priesthoods maintained sanctuaries, and these sanctuaries had what? Schools. It's where the schools of the prophets came from. Again, prophecy grew out of priesthood, and we're going to come to that momentarily. Practically on its edge, right? Yes? So Jeremiah can be the old Mm -mm. Mm -mm 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 -mm. You missed the point. When was the Ark narrative from its opening line to its closing line written? I gave years. I actually dated it to years. Shiloh was destroyed about 1050. The question it ends with is, where's the consecrated priesthood and why does it have to, the consecrated priesthood have to go to the Canaanites? When did that apply? During the period that the Ark was still where? Still at Kirith Yerim. Okay, in the 20 years following the destruction of Shiloh, in 1050 to 1030. That's when the Ark narrative was written. The compiler of Deuteronomy to Second Kings, the Deuteronomist, is writing in the time of Josiah more than 400 years later. He is not the author, as he is not the author of most of what he uses. The great majority of the material from Deuteronomy to Second Kings, he didn't author, he reconstructed. Put new beginnings and endings, frequently new interpretive centers to give it a whole new twist, but he's not the author. The mm. question Ed asked was why would the Deuteronomist, who is a Bushite, use something that's so anti-Moshite and we looked at that. Was Eliezer the son of Abinadab he was not a Aaronite? Yeah he was. Yes. Let's remind ourselves who are those guys again? Abinadab. What does that mean? We're going to ignore what the word Nadab actually means, but let's just start with the front of it. What does it mean? My father. Yeah. Okay, so say what the name means. My father is Nadab. Let me think. Have I ever heard of Nadab? Uh, has anybody here ever heard of Nadab? Uh, Nadab. Anything sound familiar here? What? Nadab and Abihu. Who are they? Sons of Aaron. So obviously a man named Abinadab is what? Remember that they kept these names alive familiarly. Let's go back to Leviticus. What? There, well, there was an Eliezer who was the son of Moses, spelled slightly differently. Huh? My father is Moses, Abi Musha. That's a good Hebrew name. Now then, where's this thing about uh, Nadab and Abihu? Where's that found? Leviticus what? Nine. Leviticus nine, really? Is that really where it is? Yeah, unholy fire. And so they were destroyed, right? The glory of Yahweh consumed them, says. All right. Now, we are saying that they were that at this time the ark was among the interior of the uh, and uh, that was a Canaanite, a Canaanite city, Kiriath Jerem, as you said in English, is a Canaanite city, and th they are temple slaves. Presumably they can be used by either the Moshite or the Aaronite priesthood. And they, the only people who have right to the ark, call, and this is the irony, that the 
the, the Gibeonites could have called for anybody. Who do they call for? Okay, so they, call for you. they have the wisdom that the rest of Israel didn't have to choose what? A righteous priesthood. I said that the author of the Ark narrative said that was the problem with Israel in the first place, that it didn't get rid of the wrong priesthood and choose the right priesthood. Getting back, Sharon, I want to tell you more. 10.1. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire on it, laid incense on it, and offered unholy fire before Yahweh, such as he had not commanded them. And they were destroyed, right? Now they turn up again. Uh, Leviticus 10 happens to be the very chapter that's in front of Leviticus 11. <laughs> and that is not coincidence. Because what is Leviticus 11? What is, the, what it, is it the beginning of? It's the manual of purification from disease, the biggest disease being sin, all of these diseases needing to be covered, and if you don't cover those diseases, they're going to kill you. Nadab and Abihu have brought what on Israel? Sin, that is to say disease, which will lead to death. So what, is, what follows immediately after their act? The story of how you purify Israel. Yes, and that's what chapter 11 is all about. Chapter 12 is about purification from ch childbirth. Uh, chapter 13 is all kinds of leprous or contagious diseases. Chapter 14 is more dis contagious diseases. Chapter 15 is more contagious diseases. And chapter 16 begins this way. Yahweh spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, making it very clear that that's still what we're talking about, when they drew near before Yahweh and died, and Yahweh said to Moses, tell Aaron your brother not to come at all times into the holy place, da 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 and what is this about? The day of covering, in which we're finally going to get rid of sin, period. The ultimate covering, right? It begins with Nadab and Abihu, and it never gets away from them. Got it? these details are never accidental it took too much time too much effort and too much expense to write in the ancient world to write any detail that was there by accident they didn't have the money they didn't have the time they didn't have the energy to put in accidental details if it's there, what must you assume? It's there for a very important reason. It's part of the theology of the story. What we're having back and forth is how priesthoods get lost and what to do about it. Okay. I'm willing to go to the next verse if you, if you are. Okay, you want to ask another question about the Ark narrative? Well, this, this whole concept of sin being the thief, is this a, a really early concept or something? No. Is it a later concept? I mean, this is something that seems like it would be, you know, like a child yeah. would think this up, you know. Uh, you don't think sin is a disease? You don't think it's... You don't think sin is a disease? The ultimate disease? You don't think sin is contagious? <laughs> I didn't even hear her. I'm not going to say that. <laughs> Who were the health officers of Israel? Who dispensed the medicines and determined whether a disease was contagious or not? Who determined whether or not you needed to be quarantined? who determined what kind of medicine could be used for what kind of disease. Where were the books of medicine kept? That's okay. all temple stuff. Before this concept, what was, what was sin looked at, at a life? Well, see, you, you got a problem. Before this, remember that sin as a concept, sin as a concept is uniquely is uniquely a biblical viewpoint. Mm -hmm. 
You can do things to make the gods mad, and that's bad. But bad means whenever you stepped into something and you're in trouble with the gods. But were the gods moral? No. When El rapes his, one of his wives and falls asleep in his own vomit, that's the high god of the pantheon, and, and nearly drowns in his own vomit, that's the highest conception of God they had, can you have such a concept as sin? No. The gods were capricious, and you never knew what they were going to do, uh, they had no consistency, and certainly no moral consistency, which is why the statement, I am Yahweh, I change not, was so important. If he's moral and has a certain law today, what do we know? He's going to be moral and have the same law tomorrow and the day after. The good thing about Yahweh is you can always tell where he's coming from because he's moral. There are things that are right and things that are wrong. Then you get sin. Sin is a biblical concept. Okay, so before they had this disease type concept, they had the God type concept where you step on God tells me, does something to you. That's not a concept of sin. No, that's not a concept of sin, but it's another concept of what's going on with my life. I mean, these people believe, well, I'm doing something wrong and I'm getting sick because of it. Before that, they thought, something happened to me because I stepped on... Uh, I made so I must have tweaked some God's nose by accident, and right? doing this to me. Yes. I used the example right at the beginning of the class that if the Hebrew walked under the coconut palm and the coconut fell on his head, what would he say? He'd say, ow, oh, that's unfortunate. Um, he's not going to bow down to the tree and wonder how he has offended the God that exists in the tree, if he's a good Yahweh. But he might say, I wonder if the Lord's trying to tell me something with this coconut on my head. He might say, I wonder if God wants me to think about this. But he wouldn't say, there's a divine spirit in the tree, and I've angered the spirit, and I better bow down right here and make some kind of offering to the tree. That's the big difference between the Hebrew worldview and the worldview around them. The totality of gods was the forces of nature. In the Bible, the totality of the Godhead is something outside of nature that's absolutely holy and moral. That's the big distinction. Sin is a disease, it's the worst disease of all. All other diseases are manifestations of sin. All other diseases tell you that sin is around. All other diseases come because we are sinful. We still believe that. That's what I was trying to get yeah. and, um, that's still our concept today. Yeah? Sin is a disease. I just wanted to see how the progression of one is you know, it's like and it's maybe that person did it, but it's maybe it's seven generations Now that was an extension of the idea. That's something when we get to Ezekiel and they, they talk about causes for the exile, we're going to examine that at great length. That's in the future. So uh, has there been progression there from the mental attitude down to the, the physical then from, from first Adam and Eve making that mental distinction of, of um, a toy to disobey and uh, we have, have we gotten a progression here um, from attitude to physical? P was the last editor of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus and Numbers. Remember? This is P material. You asked if it was early. Of all the material in the Bible, it's what? It's the latest. And no, there's no progression because P describes the entrance of sin in exactly the same way as a disease that broke out. Yes. What was the first? E? To have the concept of sin as a disease? Any concept. Of sin? Of anything. Of God or, you know, you could possibly do something wrong. Oh, no, no. I think you misunderstand. We don't believe that the concept of the true God was ever lost anywhere along the way. Look at the ancient stories in the Bible, the really ancient stories in, in Genesis, the story of the Tower of Babel, the story of the flood in its original form, the story of um, the Garden of Eden and Paradise. Those are all stories that we find in what part of the world? They're not stories native to Canaan. Those are never found in the Canaanite uh, cycle of stories. There's nothing in the Baal epic about a, a Garden of Eden and a Paradise Lost. 
There's nothing about a Tower of Babel and confusion. There's nothing about a worldwide flood. All of those stories come from what part of the world? All of those stories come from where? We find all kinds of stuff in the Old Testament related to the Baal epic in Canaan, but none of these stories are. Where do they come from? Mesopotamia. Yes, well, it's southern Mesopotamia where they have a story about a worldwide flood. It's southern Mesopotamia where they have the story about the Tower of Babel. It's southern Mesopotamia where they have the story about the, the Garden of Paradise that was lost. So I ask you, Roy, how do these stories happen to be in our Bible, which was created on Palestinian soil centuries later and far removed? How do these stories happen to be in our Bible? Abraham, Rob. Of course. They are the stories that came from the patriarchal period. They are the surviving remnants of patriarchal religion. These are stories that Abraham told Isaac. They are the stories that represent the most ancient known sources of biblical religion. They came to Canaan with the patriarchs. And they are evidence to us that a concept of a one God who brought destruction for sin was held in Mesopotamia anciently. Again, you are talking about they. They is not the human race. Just a minute, just a minute, stop. What does Genesis, and you were in the class when you heard this, what does Genesis say about the truth? It was carried by what? One single family in the whole world. They who knew it they who knew what sin was, was how many people? At one point, according to the Bible, it was how many people? Seventy. In the whole human race. That's the idea of the remnant. There's no need to be fuzzy about this. The truth was maintained by one single family only in the whole world. And that is why they were elected. How did they get elected? They elected themselves by what? Keeping alive a knowledge of the truth. Okay. Was there a concept of sin? No. There was a concept of something that's wrong. What's wrong? What's the definition of what's wrong? Whatever doesn't make the gods happy, that's what's wrong. What's right? What's good? Whatever makes the gods happy. Okay. But... But there was one family that didn't believe that. One family and one family only that did not believe that, that believed that sin was anything that was immoral, that there was a God who had a righteous character. There was only one family that believed that. And, the, and Israel is its spiritual descendants. Okay, now let's go on. They did believe that all the way through, that there, was moral. there were morals from the beginning. There were morals from Adam to Abraham. That's what Genesis said. To this system, to exactly. Oh, okay. All right, now, let's read the first verse. What's the first verse of the next section? Anyone? Where's the once upon a time? What verse is it? 7-2. Okay, here's the once upon a time. Everybody? From the day that the ark was lodged at kiriath Jerem, a long time passed, some twenty years, and all the house of Israel lamented after Yahweh. Then Samuel said to all the house of Israel, oh, this is back into the Samuel stuff. We haven't heard from him for a while. Right? Where were we when we were talking about Samuel? Where was that? No. Four one. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Samuel was uh, a prophet for all Israel the last time we were reading the prophetic literature about Samuel. Different author, different place, prophetic movement. Samuel is the founder of the prophetic movement. That's what we're in here. So we know who Samuel is because we've read some background. This story begins. 
from the day that the ark was lodged at Kiriath Jerim, a long time passed, some twenty years. And all the house of Israel lamented after Yahweh. And then Samuel said to all the house of Israel, see all Israel again, if you are returning to Yahweh with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtaroth, uh, the Asherim actually, from among you, and direct your heart to Yahweh and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So Israel put away the Baals and the Asherim, and they served Yahweh only. So this is a great revival here. What does it make you think of? Hmm? Mm -hmm. What does it make you think of? What does it make you think of? Put away the foreign gods. Uh, Jacob. He, uh, Jacob, yes, at, uh, also, tells his family to put put away the foreign gods. That may, it makes me think of that. Uh, what else does it make me think of? Uh, what great covenant ceremony is called to mind here? What great covenant ceremony is called to mind here? One of the great turning points in Israel's history where someone tells them to put away the foreign gods once and for all. Joshua, Joshua where's the great covenant ceremony in Joshua? What? Joshua 24? Yes. All right, what did he say? Verse uh, 14. Now therefore fear Yahweh, and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve Yahweh. And if you be unwilling to serve Yahweh, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of which your fathers served in the region beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve Yahweh. This is clearly intended by the prophetic writer to be a reflex of Joshua's great covenant ceremony in Joshua 24. Then Samuel said, If you are returning to Yahweh with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the Asherim from among you and direct your heart to Yahweh and serve him only, and then he will deliver you out of the hands of the Philistines. So Israel put away the Baal and the Asherim and served Yahweh only. Then Samuel said, Gather all Israel at Mizpah, and I will pray to Yahweh for you. So they gathered at Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before Yahweh. I wonder what that means. They drew water and poured it out. What could that mean? And fasted on that day. What does they drew water and poured it out before Yahweh mean? Well, we'll come to it. And said there, we have sinned against Yahweh. Whenever there's a revival, there's a concept of sin. Samuel judged the people of Israel at Mizpah, which gives us some idea what a judge judging means. Now when the Philistines heard that the people of Israel had gathered at Mizpah, the tyrants of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the people of Israel heard of it, they were afraid of them and cried to, Is to Samuel. And they say, and this is going to become key for us. Do not cease to cry to Yahweh our God for us. Mark these words well. They're going to turn up later. Do not cease to cry to Yahweh our God for us that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. So Samuel took a sucking lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to Yahweh. Samuel is a priest, you see. And Samuel cried to Yahweh for Israel, as the covenant mediator does, and Yahweh answered him. <coughs> you think of anyone who cries to Yahweh for Israel and saves them? Moses. Moses. As Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack Israel. But Yahweh thundered with a mighty voice that day against the Philistines and threw them into confusion and they were routed before Israel. So how does Samuel win the battle? Through what? 
not through not through what? Not through military means. He cries to Yahweh and Yahweh saves them by natural events. And the men of Israel went out to Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and smote them as far as below Bethkar. <coughs> then Samuel took a stone, a steel it, and set it up between Mizpah and Jeshana and called its name the Stone of Help. For he said, this far the Lord has helped us. R recognize this passage? This far, meaning how physically, geographically far. Not up to this point, but how far. So the Philistines were subdued and did not again enter the territory of Israel. And the hand of Yahweh was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. The cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel. From Ekron to Gath, from one end of Philistia to the other. <coughs> and Israel rescued their territory from the hand of the Philistines. What does this sound like? <coughs> what is it? What in? Hmm? It's the end of one of the books of Judges. Which one? I put them right up here for you on the board. I labeled them, dated them, gave authorship. What is this? Hmm? What? I gave you three levels. Which one is this? Well, the first book of Saviors was very truncated, of course. Is this the first or the second level? <coughs> Not the last level, because the last level is what we have here, and this surely isn't the end. Got a long way to go to the end of Second Kings. What? Which one? Well, what did the first book of Saviors end with? With Saul. With Saul, of course. And that's been reworked. Saul's place has been taken over by Samuel in First Samuel 1. So if it's not the first level and it's not the third level... The second, I said. <laughs> oh, Sharon, I couldn't miss it. This is not the earliest book of saviors that ended with a comparison between Sam Samson and Saul that ended with the comparison between Samson and Saul whose place has been taken by Saul? First Samuel 1, whose place has been taken by Saul? Samuel, yes. What group would have glorified Samuel? What group would have glorified Samuel? Hmm? The prophetic movement. Why? He was the great founder. Yes. In the prophetic book, here we come to the end. <clears throat> what was the ideal person to which Israel had been moving all this time? As far as the prophets were concerned, who was the great figure to which Israel had been moving all these centuries? Samuel. Samuel does everything that Moses set out to do. He subdues the land. It begins with Moses and it ends with Samuel. How bad is the Philistine threat? after Samuel's finished with them. There is no Philistine threat. What about the Amorites, the people of the land? There's peace between them. Yes. Uh, uh, we're just coming to an end and we're trying to figure out what end this is. In this, in this work, we're beginning with Moses and ending with Samuel. 
The end is that we finally come to the ideal figure who fulfills all that God has promised. Israel is on the land of the peace. The enemy nations are subdued in front of the ideal prophet. Okay? Okay? Who's the ideal prophet then? Samuel is. And if this were the true end of the story, from the prophetic viewpoint, what did they need? What did Israel need? Just a good prophet and that was what? That was just fine. Did it need a military? No, because a good prophet could do what? A good prophet could ask the Lord and the Lord could rain down hailstones or thunder thunder or bring an earthquake or whatever. Did they need a standing army? No. Did they need great military judges even? No. What'd they need? Just a good prophet to take care of things. Under Samuel, the ideal is achieved. That's all they needed. Anything beyond this was beside the point. So obviously that prophetic book would have been very early, very shortly after Samuel. And what they're saying is we don't need anything besides Samuel or a king or anything like that. All we need now is what? Another good prophet. Like Moses was and like Samuel was. That's all we need. Does the prophetic viewpoint carry the day? No, not hardly. Not hardly. All right. Not at all. No. no, has nothing to do with what we're talking about here. Okay. All right, now then, this was once the end of the story. There was once a book beginning with Moses that ended with Samuel that said everything was complete in the circle of prophets. All we need is to keep on doing what we were doing with those good prophets and everything will be taken care of. All right? But we said the prophetic viewpoint did not carry the day. The prophetic viewpoint did not carry the day. Some folks were beginning to think what? Yeah. The very wording of 1 Samuel 7 tells you that this book was constructed as a polemic against something. The book of the Savior prophets from Moses to Samuel was written obviously against some idea. What idea was it written against? Huh? What? That we should have a king. What do we really need? We don't need a king. We don't need judges. What do we really need? We need a good prophet. All right. Now there's some linking verses here. Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. And he went a circuit year by year to Bethel, Gilgal, and Mizpah. Well, we recognize Bethel as a holy place and Gilgal as the old holy place of Joshua's time. And he judged Israel in all these places. Then he would come back to Ramah, for his home was there, and he also administered justice to Israel. And he built there an altar to Yahweh. All right. Those linking verses are directed toward what happens next. Now when we come to 1 Samuel 8, we're coming to one of the great transitional passages in the whole Bible. There's probably no more important transitional section in the Bible than 1 Samuel 8 to 12. When we come here, we're coming to a key passage. Miss this. You don't know most of what's coming thereafter or why. This is a key passage. Every single section in here is of great significance. Right? So when we come to 1 Samuel 8 to 12, we're coming to something that is very, very significant. Let's read. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of the first was Joel, the name of the second Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. What's going on here? What is this? Who are these people? This is the assembly. The assembly of the elders of Israel. These are the people who do what? 
They run the country. This is their constituent assembly, their congress. And they came uh, to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you're old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to govern us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel, they said, give us, when they said, give us a king to govern us, Samuel prayed to Yahweh, and Yahweh said to Samuel, hearken to the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they've rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds which they have done to me from the day I brought them out of Egypt even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now hearken to their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the mishpat, the legal constitutional rights of the king who will reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of Yahweh to the people who were asking a king from them, from him. He said, these will be the, the manner, the way, the legal do, the constitutional right. This is very important. We're going, to, we're going to examine this in all sorts of facets of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariotry and his horsemen to run before his chariotry. He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and fifties, some to plow his ground, to reap his harvest, and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariotry. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his slave. He will take the tenth of your grain and the vineyards and give it to his officers and his servants. He will take your men servant and maid servant and the best of your cattle and your asses and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall become his slave. And in that day you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourself but Yahweh will not answer on that day now what is going on here what is going on here well that's obvious but what is going on here no, 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 no. You're missing the point. What is going on here? Yes? Not at all. What's going on here? I don't think that anything's being established and nobody's forsaken anything yet. What's going on here? Well, what he said here never happened, so that's not a good guess. <laughs> what he said here never happened, so that's not a good guess. What is going on here? <coughs> well, what are they really forsaking? What are they rejecting? God's rulership? Whose rulership? I didn't hear anything about God's rulership departing from Israel in this passage. I don't hear a word about God's rulership leaving Israel here. What's going on? What are they asking for? Well, who stands to lose then? Tell me what groups stand to lose. The prophetic movement stands to lose. Anyone else? Priesthood. Well, the priesthood, of course, because up to that time, where had prophets come from? From the priesthood. Okay, priesthood and prophecy stand to lose political power under this arrangement. Anyone else? Oh, well, now what's really happening here is, what have they asked for? What? 
they've asked for a king. Have they asked for uh, an absolute monarch like Louis XIV who will enslave them? Is that what they said? What? Did all the other nations have kings like this? I think you're missing the point. Is this what they wanted? Is what Samuel describes in verse 10 and following what they're after? No. Certainly not. I'm going to say again, what's going on here? What? They want a military leader who can gather an army and fight on the same military level of prowess with the king of Ammon and the king of Moab and the king of Philistia. They're asking for a king who can be like the kings around them who's successful militarily. I'm going to ask you again. Are they asking for the king described in verse 10 and following? Absolutely not. What is Samuel doing? What is he doing? Well, first of all, who is he addressing? He's addressing the assembly. Now, assembly of what? The tribal elders. Okay, who do they represent? Who do they represent, Ron? What people? The landowners. Of what people? The Israelites. What does that include? What does it not include? What is Israel? We've been all through this with judges. What is Israel? What tribes? They're pretty specific here. There's not a lot of hazy thinking here. Can you name some? Ephraim, Manasseh, Benjamin. Okay, then there's the big Jezreel Valley. Then to the northern tribes, Zebulun. Naphtali, Dan, Asher, good <laughs> Asher. <laughs> Who is not included? Judah. Well, Benjamin certainly is in the north. Well, that's what son of the south means. He was the southernmost most tribe in the league. Judah, keep going. Simeon, Kenaz, right. Caleb. Jerachmiel, oh, I'm close, we've got five or six. <laughs> the six southern tribes are not counted. Who else is not counted? Who else is not here talking to Samuel on this day? What? Reuben. Reuben. Gad. And half the tribe of Manasseh. In other words, we no longer call these Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh. That's just too long. And instead of saying Reuben, Gad, half the tribe of Manasseh, what do we say? Gilead. Gilead. Right? Jephthah was the leader of what? Gilead. And we found that Gilead had its own set of tribal elders and a constituent assembly. And this assembly wanted to make Jephthah their head, right? And they met in assembly and he bargained with them. Do you remember? That's the stuff of politics. Are you are you all following? Now, now, here comes the tribal assembly, knowing that Samuel is old and is going to die soon, and that his sons are no worthy successors. Here they come. And they all come, every one of them, all 70 of them, Every last one of them wants a king and is certain this is the right thing to do. Is that how you think it happened? Is that the way things happen? What? You suppose that some may have been less desirous of a king? And some may have been not only less desirous, some may have not wanted the idea at all. Did none of them follow the prophetic movement? So let us say that here is the assembly, and they have come, and what goes on in, this, in an assembly? Well, politics is religion in Israel, isn't it? What the assembly does is brought about by 
by finish the sentence. What the assembly does is brought about by fill in the name. What the assembly does is brought about by let all the people say Yahweh. What the assembly does is brought about by Yahweh. Everybody say it with me. We will remember it easier. What the assembly does is brought about by Yahweh. God rules Israel. When Israel goes well or ill, who is leading them? Yahweh. Ah. So now they come to Samuel to debate. Right? This is a proposal that has been set in front in assembly. We see them debating over here in Judges with Jephthah. He says, well, if you'll make me military leader, I won't go. I want to be elected head of Gilead. No, we can't do that because of who you are. If who I am is a problem with you, then find yourself a leader to fight your battles and let God destroy you. Well, no, we can't do that. Okay, if you, if you win the battle, we will make you head after all. Now, you understand this means that I want to be absolute ruler of Gilead for the rest of my life? Um, yeah, we understand that. And so it goes back and forth in Judges. Now, we could have summarized that whole process by saying, just as it does in a later verse in Judges, that what? And God gave Gilead a deliverer. Now, which is true? Which of these things is true? That Gilead bargained back and forth with the assembly, back and forth they argued, or that God gave them a deliverer? Which is true? Again, which is true? Yeah. To say that they argued back and forth and he bargained and they, they turned him down and then they saw their desperation and they bargained some more and finally they came to a conclusion and he won the battle. And to say... God raised up a deliverer for them, which is true? They're both true. Now, which is true? God raised up a monarchy, or they debated back and forth and they argued it through, and there was this faction and that faction, and back and forth they fought. Which is true? Later on, we're going to find a passage that says Samuel decided, because God told him to, it's time to raise up a king. And so Samuel went off and anointed the king without anybody saying a word to him about it. He just decided that he was old, it was time for a king, and he made a king. Now, which is true? That God decided it was time for a king, or that people came and argued back and forth, and Samuel didn't like the idea at all, and finally he did it. Which is true? Both are true. Are we going to say that Saul was raised up by Yahweh to save Israel as its king, or that the people came and they asked for a king, and Samuel reacted violently, and they discussed it back and forth for quite a while before they did it. Which is true? Both are true. Now, what is Samuel doing here? Look at verses 10 and following again. What is he doing here? Has anybody suggested that what we ought to have is a ruthless, merciless dictator who will steal our sons and daughters and enslave us? Has anybody made such a suggestion? Absolutely not. I ask you again, what is Samuel doing here? He is not prophesying. He's printing it in the worst terms possible so that what? If Samuel is speaking this way in the assembly, what does he think or hope? That by speaking this way, what? He will get them to change their minds. Absolutely. Yes. And so what kind of a thing... Listen, who stands to lose power in this picture of a king that he has drawn here? First, name some groups. The prophetic movement, right away, the head prophet will be displaced as the leader of the government. The prophetic movement stands to lose power. Who else? The priests will definitely lose their legislative power. The priests make the laws. That's all we see them all in Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. The priests will be dispossessed from their legislative authority. Ah, yes. What's about this 
taking your sons and your daughters and your grain of your fields and your asses and your male slaves and your female slaves and so forth. Not the people. No. How readest thou, Clonel? The elders. To whom is he speaking? And what does he say? If you do consider well constituent assembly, runner of the government, if you do this, what? It's not just me, and it's not just the priests. It's not the priests and the prophets who serve Yahweh that, that is going to lose power here. It's what? It's you, constituent elders, you, senate that runs the country, you are going to lose power if you put a king in. They, the, well, of course, that's exactly the point. Look, even after Solomon had created the largest and richest empire of his day, what did his son have to do? He had to go humbly to the elders and say, will you elect me king? And what did they say? No. no. And what did he have to do? He had to get in his chariot and it says what? Flee for his life. This never happened. So don't tell me he was prophesied. When the house of Ahab, the, the most powerful dynasty in the West in its day, when the house of Ahab crossed the prophetic movement and poor old Elisha was dying, what did he say? He said, listen, Jehu, I'm on my way to Sheol. But you, you go kill the king of Syria. And when you're done killing the king of Assyria, go kill the king of Israel. And when you're done killing the king of Israel, kill the king of Judah for good measure. That's what the prophet did. And he died, and what did Jehu do? He went and killed the king of Syria, and then what? Then the kings of Judah and Israel were delighted with this wonderful commander of theirs, and they were delighted up until the moment that what? He killed them. Yeah. So, here's a picture of what could happen as Samuel draws it, that designed to scare the wits out of whom? The elders. But what did they do? <laughs> but the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. And they said, no. But we will have a king over us that, that we also may be like all the nations and that our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. Their answer is what? Don't misread their answer. I've heard a lot of nonsense about this passage and, and I want you to see it clearly. They do not say, no, we want a king just like what you described. Their answer is what? No, we don't want a king like that, Samuel. That's exactly what we don't want. What do we want? We want a king who will be our governor and will fight our battles. And they're making it clear that this king what? They intend to have what? Very strong limitations on the kind of king they want. Ah. I see. When Samuel heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of Yahweh. Yahweh said to Samuel, hearken to their voice and make them a king. Interesting. Samuel then said to the men of Israel, go every man to his city. Why did he send them away? And where does it go from here? The next verse is, a, is all is totally different. Where, where's the next verse in this story? Hmm? The people have gathered, the assembly has gathered together to him at Mizpah. They have one commitment from Samuel at God's voice to make a king of the type that they want. Samuel, having determined that there will be a limited kingship, sends the assembly away from him at Mizpah. What is the purpose of sending them away? Get 
candidates. What? Candidates. Candidates. Yeah, yes. What these people represent? What? They, they are a constituent assembly. What do they have to do? Yes, and they've got to talk to their constituents about the fact that we met in assembly and asked for a king. Samuel has consulted with Yahweh and what? Has given his permission for a king. Now the people had to be told this, right? And they had to consider, and doubtless the various ramifications of kingship would have been, this was an innovation. Do you think everybody just headlong rushed to Gilgal and made a king? Is that how it works? Is that how it works in real life? No. They had to go back and they had to consider it. And do you suppose there was any discussion around those campfires and in those courts of those cities? And the, as the elders sat at the gates, do you think any of the constituents said, no, you won't have a king here in Bethlehem, I warn you. You think any of that went on? Went, went on? You make a king, you... Uh, uh, you think there was any of that? Time had to pass before what? In all politics, there has to be a leavening before what? The consensus can develop. Samuel has sent the people away from him at Mizpah. What's the next verse? Verse 15. 10, 17. Uh, what does it say, Don? Yes. Having sent them away from Mizpah, what does he do? Calls, them, calls the assembly back into session. Did everybody get 1017? Everything else is something entirely different from a totally different source that has nothing to do with the story that we're talking about here. The editor, for obvious reasons, the Deuteronomist, has put it together. I understand why he did what he did, but right now I want to follow the story. Now Samuel called the people together to Yahweh at Mizpah, and he said to the people of Israel, Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians from the hand of all the kingdoms that were oppressing you. But you have this day rejected your God who saves you from all your calamities and your distresses and you have said no but set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before Yahweh by your tribes and by your militia units. Okay? Calls the army of the Lord together at Mizpah. Evidently, clear to me, that as the elders have gone back to their constituents and talked, what consensus has developed? What? We do want a military type kingship, a military commander type king to reign over us. Then Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel near and the tribe of Benjamin was taken by law. That's not a surprise. What tribe is under the greatest military pressure? Who is really stuck of all the tribes? What's the real trouble at this time? Benjamin. Why is Benjamin in trouble? Because the passes come up from the coastal plain into Benjamin. It is they who must face the Philistines. And as if that weren't bad enough, what is going on directly across the Jordan Valley from there? The Ammonites, the king of Ammon, is extending his power into Gilead. And who's right in his path on their eastern side? The Benjaminites. The Benjaminites are under pressure east and west. They are the tribe that has the greatest trouble. Let me take a guess. I will make a guess. Of all the tribal elders, what tribe certainly must have been asking for a king most strongly. Who would have been asking for a king most strongly? Who would have been most desperate for a king? Yes. And so when the lot falls on Benjamin, what am I going to say? Is there a surprise there? There's no surprise there. Indeed, if the lot fell on anybody other than Benjamin, what? I'd have been shocked. He brought the tribe of Benjamin near by its families. And the family of the Matrites was taken by lot. And finally he brought the family of the Matrites near man by man. 
and Saul son of Kish was taken by Lot. But when they sought him, he couldn't be found. So they inquired again of Yahweh, Did the man come here? And Yahweh said, Behold, he has hidden himself among the baggage. Then they ran and fetched him from there. And when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. And I find out that he's part of the warrior class, that he's part of the family that has been facing the Philistines. And once again, I say what? No surprise here. And of the family facing the Philistines face to face in the passes, they've got the biggest guy in the family. And what would I say? No surprise here. Okay. All right. Why is he hiding in the baggage? Having been in several battles with the Philistines, I would say that maybe his father was voting for kingship in the assembly, but what? <laughs> yeah, maybe the family as a family wanted kingship as an idea, but when it came right down to him being the one who had to go out there, what did he decide? This is not such a good idea after all. To Army yes. Who was it that uh, Samuel asked come? Present yourselves before Yahweh by your tribe and by your militia unit. What has Samuel called together? What kind of king did they say they wanted? They did not want an emperor as Samuel described. All they wanted was a simple military leader. Okay, Samuel says, get the assembly back and call up the militia. Did everybody know what he was doing? If he had sent you away unhappily, and then he called for the elders to come back to Mizpah, and he called for the militia, what would you know? Huh? Here comes the king. And so immediately thereafter, what would we expect? If, if Samuel's called the militia together, and they're going to get a king, then what's going to happen? Holy war should follow directly. And I suppose there were some that were greatly relieved, right? And others who what? Thought, oh boy, this is going to be... <laughs> yes. Yeah. Do you suppose there were any people who looked at, at Saul hidden among the baggage and said, oh, this... <laughs> <laughs> this was not a good idea <laughs> do you, how do you suppose Samuel felt when the lock came on the man he was hidden in the baggage and Samuel announced to the people your new king is hidden in the baggage <laughs> yes yes okay so what happened here yes yes here we go uh, then they ran and fetched him from there he's taller and Samuel said to all the people do you see him whom Yahweh has chosen? Now this tells me something about Samuel, what Samuel was up to earlier in that first assembly meeting. Right? Don't you do this. If you do this, you're rejecting Yahweh as you always have. And now what is it? And now what is it? It's look on him whom Yahweh has chosen. And I want to say, which is true? Yes. Okay. There's none like him among all the people. And Samuel actually sounds like what? <laughs> all of a sudden, Samuel sounds like what? Like he's what? This sounds like it was Samuel's idea. And it sounds like it was God's idea. Now, wait a minute. I thought, it's a, I thought he started off by saying this is a rejection of Yahweh. And now what did he say? This is the one whom Yahweh has chosen. Look at him. All right. And all the people shouted, Long live the king, quoting the Baal epic. What did the gods say when Baal came back from winning his battle? They said, the 70 elders in the cosmic mountain, they all stood up and said what? Long live the king. Ah, well, where this is... Then, now catch this, then Samuel told the people the constitutional rights 
of the king. Mishpat. The legal rights of the king. And he wrote them in a scroll and laid it up before Yahweh. Here's one of the most interesting sentences in the Bible. Here's the man standing there. Samuel speaks as if this was the Lord's idea and his. And he tells the people what the constitutional rights, mishpat, are of the new kingship. Huh. I thought Samuel was planning to lose power. A moment ago we said that the prophetic movement stood to lose power, right? And now what's happening? Uh, what, what's he doing? He's writing the Constitution and laying it up before Yahweh and he's telling the assembly and the militia, the army of Israel gathered before him, what the rights and duties of kingship are, what the constitutional limits are of kingship. What has Samuel just done? Look, the idea of a king was the creature of the assembly, and he thought it was a terrible idea, and he threatened them with the most awful thing. And now it goes through, and the king has become what? His creature. He's running the show. <laughs> hmm. Very interesting. Then Samuel sent all the people away, each one to his home. Saul also went to his home at Gibeah, and with him went men of valor whose hearts God had touched. Some of the militia went with him and said, this is our new king, we've got to go with him. But some sons of Belial said how can this jerk save us reading it literally some sons of Belial said how can this jerk save us and they despised him and brought him no present but he held his peace so were all the people of one mind Samuel called up the militia so that what they wanted a, a military commander of king, what? Here's the king, here's the army. Some of the, those whom the Lord's heart had touched went with him, and some what? Uh, is this an auspicious beginning? With the Ammonites on one side and the Philistines on the other side, how would you feel after this day? And say, wouldn't you like to know what Samuel wrote? I know what he wrote, word for word. I know where it is, because he told us where he put it. See you next time. The word that you there, the, the Mishpat was the same that was used earlier when he was threatening them with all this. Yes, when he was threatening them with this terrible manner of, of, of monarchy, it's exactly the same word. And we're going to follow that.